I, I wish I get as many questions, but but then we would have to skip dinner if I got as many questions. So I, I also want to thank uh, Walter for bringing us into Genova in this very nice weather. Uh, so I I was brought into this group by my colleague Marilyn Gunner because I a few years back I I was interested in doing proton hopping simulations. So that's what I I will present. And then um, my, my when I when I saw that I had 40 minutes, I realized that my my abstract was too narrow. So I added some more material. I added one more paper, and I changed the title. So I will present. First, I, I will describe the algorithm we use for problem hopping simulations, and then I will present what the abstract uh, says. And at the end, I will talk about another project where we compare classical and ab initio MD of uh, hydronium and proton transfer. So uh, you all know that um, uh, grotus hopping is, is very important in many biological processes, but existing classical MD cannot deal with proton transfer. So if you want to study proton transfer, you need to do either quantum mechanics in water clusters or QMMM in, in a uh, in a larger system or ab initio MD, but these are very expensive. Alternatively, one can use um, these um, uh, modern dissociative force fields that started with Stillinger, and lately there is uh, uh, the Reacts FF is the most uh, common force field that allows bonds to break, but um, it's hard to do with proteins because we don't have a reacts FF force field for proteins. Uh, there is one for water. Um, then there is the empirical valence bond method that was invented by Warshall and extended by Voth. There is has been a lot of work uh, applying the multi-state EVB to, uh, to proton transfer. More empirical methods like QHOP was pro proposed by HELPS in 2001. More recently, a lambda dynamics based method by Grenhoff. And related to this is the constant PHMD simulations. The difference is that in constant PHMD, the proton appears and disappears. Uh, it's in equilibrium with some uh, reservoir in the bulk. Whereas in proton hopping simulations, the proton has to go to a specific site. It just doesn't disappear. So a few years back, I developed a, a new algorithm for proton hopping simulations. The idea is that we use classical models for hydronium and hydroxide. The work uh, on hydroxide is still in progress. We don't have a, a finalized model. Then we do. Uh, molecular dynamic simulations interrupted by periodic hop attempts. So every 10 or 20 steps, we look at the existing H bonds. We have a list of labile protons and potential acceptors. And we ask, can the proton hop from uh, this molecule to another molecule? Then we use a certain acceptance criteria. And if that is satisfied, then the proton hop is accepted. The way, this was implemented in the CHARM program, and the way it was implemented, it's this. So the, the proton structure fun, uh, file, that is the number of atoms and bonds, is the same, doesn't change. What changes during the simulation is the atom types and the partial charge. So when a proton hops, it becomes a dummy atom, and the new location, it changes from a dummy atom to an actual proton. So we have to start with the protein in fully protonated form. And for water, we need to have enough protonatable water. So protonatable water means that it is like uh, tip three water, but it has an additional site that in, if you have water, it's a dummy atom. When it, a proton gets there, it becomes a, an actual proton. So usually here we have like five or 10 H3O residues, and typically one of them is an actual hydronium. Then if this uh, hydronium wants to donate a proton to a tip 3 molecule, 
this is not possible, so we exchange, we flip the uh, positions of TIP3 with an H3O residue, and we do the transfer to an H3O residue. So, okay, the, the acceptance criterion. Okay, uh, ideally, we would like to use something like Metropolis uh, uh, Monte Carlo, but the problem is that the changes in energy that we calculate when a proton hops are too high. We're talking about 20 to 30 kilocal per mole. So in that case, uh, a, a proton hop would never be accepted. So we use a metropolis with an empirical threshold. We say, if the energy is above a certain threshold, then we accept, otherwise we reject. And we adjust this threshold to reproduce the proton diffusion coefficient in, in water. For hydronium, we use we started using the, a model proposed by Sagnella and Voth. The problem with that is that um, the solvation-free energy in TIP3 water is too low, too small. Experimentally, it is uh, larger. So to reproduce the solvation-free energy, we polarized the, the molecule, we increased the partial charges, and we could reproduce the solvation-free energy. However, the the structure around this molecule is too, uh, uh, there's too much structure compared to avenues. And I'll talk about this at the end. So the, one, one of the first tests was uh, gram A, which is, yeah, actually it, it's, uh, Marilyn said it's difficult to work with, but it depends what you do. If you do standard MD, it's a very nice system to, to work with. We know a lot about it especially the conductance properties for ions, for protons, are very well characterized as a function of pH. We see an almost linear increase in uh, conductance as the pH is lowered. So here the test was, with, uh, I took uh, gramicide A and I put two, pro uh, two hydroniums and two, two chlorides on either side. Then applied voltage and counted the proton permeation events. From those, in a given amount of time, you get the current, and the conductance is the ratio of current over voltage. So uh, Maria mentioned that there are two methods of getting uh, these con conductances. One is to uh, calculate the free energy profile and then use a formula to get the conductance. And the other is the direct way where you apply voltage and you count permeation events. The different, one difference here is that the voltage uh, is applied only to the H3O residues. It doesn't apply to everything because under this, we have to use very high voltage that is unphysiological. So under these conditions, the system would be destabilized. If we apply the voltage only to the H3O residues, then it, the system is stable. So from this, we got a certain conductance for the two, for the standard hydronium model, the, the conductance was too high. For the polarized hydronium was closer to the experimental value. And uh, the reason for that is that um, the rate limiting step here is to get the proton into the channel. So it's the dissolvation that is critical. Uh, and of course, if the solvation free energy is uh, too low, that step will be favored and the conductance will be faster. Under the same conditions, hydroxide does not permeate. So this is with a preliminary uh, model of hydroxide. And this is in, uh, in agreement with experiment. For the amino acid side chains are more difficult. So here we want to be able to reproduce the thermodynamics and the kinetics of amino acid protonation and deprotonation. But there is um, very little data on kinetics of protonation and deprotonation. These data are for acetic acid and imidazole from the 60s. And we see that k on is very fast. It's, it's close to diffusion limited. And K off is quite slow. 
So for uh, acetic acid, it, it takes about a microsecond to deprotonate an acetic acid. And for imidazole, it takes about a millisecond. This presents a, a problem with dynamic simulations because if you have a system, a pro problem where histidine needs to deprotonate, you would have to wait uh, a millisecond for that to happen. And, you know, it's not practical. So what, what I do in these simulations is to artificially accelerate the deprotonation. So I basically use models that have very low pKa. So I can observe deprotonation in, a, uh, in something like a nanosecond. And then I hope to later correct for that by computing the, the actual rates. The, when you break and make bonds, the energies of those bonds must be added to your energy function. And uh, so there is an extra term in the force field that uh, accounts for the energies of uh, the bonds. It, it, this doesn't matter when you have water to water transfer because it's the same bond. But when you have uh, amino acid state change to water, then it makes a difference. So the way to determine these, um, uh, these parameters is to do free energy simulations in water and see what value reproduces the experimental pKa. Um, recently, I applied this to the M2 uh, influenza M2 proton channel. So I've already talked about this last year at Telluride and at ACS, so I'll just summarize what the findings were. So M2 is a great model system. We have many structures. It's a tetramer, it's a proton selective channel, and it's activated by low external pH. There, are, there is a tetrad of uh, histidine residues in, at the center, and also important is a tetrad of uh, tryptophans and aspartates. So the, the main questions in M2 is what is the mechanism of low pH activation? And what is the mechanism of proton selectivity? And, and uh, the, the most intriguing aspect of this uh, in this channel is the unidirectionality of proton transport, that is, this channel transfers protons only from outside to inside. When you create pH gradient in the opposite direction, there is no proton current. So what, what I did here was to run a number of um, simulations with a proton on one side or the other side, use voltage to drive the proton to the other side, and, and compare the inward and outward direction. So the main conclusions from this was that um, there, there were three possible mechanisms for asymmetric conductance. One was that the aspartate, this layer of aspartates, electrostatically traps the proton. So I, I would observe that the proton gets there and gets stuck and doesn't move outward. Uh, a second factor is the the proton would get trapped at the uh, at, at the edges of this of the inner vestibule because the the channel has some somewhat of a conical shape. There are fenestrations that are covered by lipids, and the protons have a, a well known affinity for hydrophobic surfaces. So the problem would go there and get stuck and wouldn't move outward. And the final factor was this orientation observed for hydronium. So if this is the tryptophan layer, this is the aspartate layer, and this is the histidine layer. The electrostatics of the system orients the hydronium with the protons inward. So in that case, that favors grotus transfer inward rather than outward. And this is one effect that we wouldn't be able to see 
if we did a free energy profile calculation. So you can, it is valid, you can do a free energy profile calculation and then, but then when you apply transition state theory, you need to account for the fact that the hydronium has a preferred orientation. So the probability of going left and right is not the same. If you account for that, then you should get the, the right answer. Okay, so now on to this new system. The voltage-gated uh, proton channel HV1. This is um, this has it's a dimer. Its monomer has 273 residues. It makes two independent pores, so we can study the two pores independently. It is proton selective, and it is homologous to the voltage sensors of uh, the potassium and sodium channels. But here you don't have a main pore. The pore is the sensor itself. The key residues are the three arginines in the S4 helix and an aspartate in the S1 helix. The, all the S4 helices of voltage sensors have arginines that respond to voltage. So what we know about these systems is that the voltage forces the S4 helix inward or outward, and that in the case of um, potassium and sodium channels, that change is transmitted to the main pore. In this case, this change itself creates a pore for protons. The one big difficulty with this system is that we don't have reliable structures for the open and the closed state. We have to use homology models. And we want to know what is the mechanism of proton permeation, the mechanism of proton selectivity, and for pH-dependent gating. So here we know that the threshold voltage for opening the channel depends on the pH difference between inside and outside. So here what I did was I, I took eight structures. There is an NMR structure in detergent micelles, but um, it is being questioned because the, the, the packing of the residues inside is not very good. There is a, a crystal structure of a hybrid between the mouse, uh, the mouse homolog and the phosphatase. It's, a, it's an artificial construct. So then everything else is, uh, is models. There is the alpha fold uh, prediction. The Tobias group generated two models, one for the closed state, one for the open state, using uh, starting from a homology model based on the hybrid, the chimera, and then applying depolarizing and polarizing voltage. So first they polarized, to create a model for the closed state, and then they depolarized to make a model for the open state. There is another homology model. There are two models based on the Siona intestinalis uh, uh, phosphatase. One was made by the Pomes group, and one I made myself using the alignment proposed in the literature. And finally, another homology model based on the Paddle chimera voltage sensor. The, the open states differ in, in, in one factor, and that is which arginine is paired with the aspartate in the open state. Is it the third arginine or the second arginine? If it's the third arginine, this implies that the S4 helix moves two helical turns. If it's the second arginine, it implies that it moves only one helical turn. So what I did here, I equilibrated this, the, all these models in a POPC bilayer, added one hydronium to the interior side. Here I look at only the outward conductance because uh, um, the, the pH dependence of gating is such that only outward conductance is observed. And then I applied high voltage, which is felt only by the H3O residues and the titratable residues, and 
did uh, five uh, half a nanosecond simulations and calculated the crossing probability in all these models. And because I saw that uh, uh, the proton would get stuck at uh, interior vestibule aspen glue residues, for some of these models, I repeated the simulations uh, uh, protonating these uh, acidic residues. So this is a summary of the results. Now the voltage, uh, I try to use the lowest voltage that allows me to see conductance events in a reasonable amount of time. So in most of these systems, this was close to three volt. So we see, for example, in, uh, and this is the number of um, permeations I see out of five simulations. So here for in NMR, I see uh, two protons crossing out of five simulations. For, uh, for these models, I see none except when I protonate the glue and asp in the interior vestibule, I see one. For the Tobias group um, models, they have the largest um, permeability. So even the closed state gives me two permeations out of five. The open state gives me four permeations out of five. The other open state models are much less permeable. I only get permeation at this volt when I protonate these uh, acidic residues. And um, to look at selectivity, I did some simulations with, uh, with sodium instead of uh, proton. And for the open state from the to Tobias group, I see no permeation at three volt, but some permeation at five volt. For the Pomes group, uh, model, which is an R2D model, I see no permeation even at 5 volt. And another control was to do these simulations with a, an actual voltage sensor. And for that, for that uh, system, I, I didn't see any permeation even at 9 volt. Now, the experimental conductance at uh, pH 5.5 was measured to be 140 femtosiemens. So if you do the um, calculation, you compute that at five volt, that would correspond to 220 nanoseconds per proton. And this is quite slow. So the fact that we see uh, proton permeation on a nanosecond time scale means that we are much faster than experiment. Of course, we have to, uh, to think of all the caveats here. Um, as I said, I use um, uh, aspen glue that is uh, that has artificially low pKa, so they deprotonate fast. The actual aspen glue with a normal pKa would take at least a microsecond to to deprotonate. So that would add additional times, additional delays to the, um, to the permeation time that would lower the conductance. Another interesting question in this system is, um, and it is somewhat controversial, is how does the proton permeate? One theory is that it, um, the ASP residue, well, this ASP residue, when you mutate this ASP residue to asparagine, to something neutral, the proton loses, the, the channel loses the proton selectivity. So it becomes, and actually becomes anion selective. So ASP 112 has been called the selectivity filter for this channel. And it has been hypothesized that this ASP gets protonated and that is mandatory effect for the proton to go through. Other, uh, other ions cannot protonate the ASP, so they get uh, uh, blocked. However, in my simulations, I, I never saw the proton go through the, the main barrier by protonating the ASP-112. So these are 
Um, these are pictures from the open state of the Tobias group. And this is the ASP-112. I do observe several uh, protonation events for this ASP, but then it, deproton it, it deprotonates again. Because the ASP is below the arginine, protonating the ASP doesn't help the proton go past the arginine. So what happens is the, the proton gets away from the ASP and bypasses the arginine through water. So it goes through a water wire. So here it interacts with ASP-112 and then it moves away and bypasses the arginine. And in the end, it starts interacting with a glutamate that is above the arginine. And we see a similar, similar events in our 2 d models. Here, first it bypasses the, um, the third arginine, and then it bypasses the, the, the second arginine and uh, gets to the outer vestibule. So the conclusion from this, and we, we, we'll discuss this, but um, we see that it goes through a water wire. Um, here, I also used uh, Nicoletta Bondar's uh, Bridge 2 program to calculate uh, H bonding networks. Um, it's a very nice program. It's very easy to use. And, and it gives you these plots of um, amino acid side chains connected either directly to each other or via a bridge of uh, five water molecules. And I wanted to see whether these plots can tell us something about the permeability of these models. And I mean, you can see that there is a constriction near the ASP-112 in all these models. But it's hard to tell the difference between them. You can't really tell. There is no clear correlation between these plots and uh, the permeability observed in the proton hopping simulations. So these are the closed models, and these are the open models. It, it's hard to see a difference between closed and open. And of course, you know, all these are models, and they may not be good. We can do the same thing for the waters, the actual waters in the pore. And we can see the h bonding connectivity. And again, here, the good thing about these plots is that you can see the amount of hydration in the, in the channel that does correlate with permeability. But um, sometimes you see discontinuities in the H bonding that uh, do not really correlate. And these are based on single frames. So something may be disconnected in one frame, and then in a new, different frame, it can get connected. So it doesn't, you can't really say something about permeability based on these plots. So the conclusions from this work, um, I, I'm claiming that proton hopping simulations can be used to evaluate the quality of structural models. Here, of course, we have uncertainties in everything. So you have approximate proton hopping simulations evaluating approximate models. And the question is, like, how do you know that it's the model and not the method? Um, but that, that, that's a valid question. And but when you when you use the same method on different models, you can at least make some evaluations about the relative permeability. You can say that this one is clearly more permeable permeable than uh, than another model. And uh, this is an interesting finding that the salt bridge is bypassed, and the aspartate does not get does not need to get protonated. Of course, there are caveats. We use a large voltage, even though it is felt only by uh, a, a small selection of uh, residues. It, it's still quite large. It might distort the paths. We accelerate the deprotonation of titratables. 
we ignore large conformational fluctuations. So if this molecule is very flexible and samples a wide range of conformations, and one conformation allows proton transfer and others don't, then what we are doing, we are taking a single conformation and running it for half a nanosecond. So it, it, we may not be able to get these, um, these conformational fluctuation effects. And the fact that we protonate the inner vestibule acidic residues, this is something that uh, may happen to some extent, but it would certainly uh, delay proton permeation. So for all these reasons, we see a permeation that is too fast compared to experiment. So how do we deal with this, um, with the kinetics? We want to study kinetics. And uh, one direction for this is to, to calculate the protonation rates of amino acids in, in, um, in a separate calculation and then correct what we see based on the rates that we infer from these calculations. So in a paper in they, they can fees, um, last year, I used Warshall's approach, uh, Warshall's extension of Marcus theory to estimate barriers for, uh, for amino acid deprotonation applied to glutamate and uh, histidine. So what you do is you take the um, deprotonated state and the protonated state and you calculate the energy of, um, uh, of proton hopping from one state and the other. And you plot as a function of, the, of this energy. So you use the energy as a reaction coordinate. You need to use some um, uh, lambda, some um, hybrid um, system simulation, uh, a, a mixed state of protonated and deprotonated to be able to get the, to sample the, the low values of delta. And this was done by Warshall in the 80s. And by doing this, you can estimate barriers and from those using transition state theory, estimate rates. So this is one way to proceed, get rates and correct the simulations uh, in that way. So, um, if I have some, like, five more minutes, okay, so th this is a, a second uh, project, another project we are completing now. We want it, as I said, we use um, classical hydronium in TIP3, and we wanted to see how close are we to, to ab initio MD. Ab initio MD is not perfect, but it's definitely much better than classical. So we got the trajectory from the Tuckerman group and um, we took the, the configurations from that uh, trajectory and calculated uh, these energy gaps. This is the delta E hop, the energy change upon moving the proton from hydronium to water. So we do the calculation using a classical force field, but based on the ab initio MD configurations. And then we compare the distributions of these uh, delta E hop, and we analyze the structural causes of the differences. So, so this is um, these are the models. To remind you, this is tip 3 p For reasons that will become clearer, we also use tip 5 p And this is the the models for hydronium, the classic, the standard Sagnella Voss, and then the more polarized. So what we see is a striking difference in the delta E hop distribution. So with tip three, we see a distribution with a median like 40 to 50 kilocal per mole. On the AIMD configurations, we get a median of uh, 10 to 15 with a large number of configurations giving even negative delta E hop. There are different ways of doing this. This is uh, with shake, this is without shake, that actually shows higher delta E hope. And the, so the question is, why is it so different? 
Why do we get much higher delta A hop in the classical simulations? Um, this is the delta A hop in tip 5P. It is a bit lower than in tip 3, but still quite much higher than uh, AIMD. So then, well, I should have mentioned this is the work of uh, postdoc uh, Manuela Maurer. And what, Ma what uh, Mela did then was to take this delta A hop and decompose it into different contributions. One is the interaction between the donor and the acceptor, the interaction between the donor and the other first shell waters other than the acceptor, the interaction between the donor and the environment, everything else, the interaction between the acceptor and the environment, and then everything else that includes long, long range electrostatics and so on. So we saw that the major contributions to delta A hop in classical simulations come from the donor acceptor interaction in tip three and the donor first shell interactions in both of these classical models. Now, why is that? So we looked at um, radial distribution functions. This is the, the gray is the AIMD result. This is the Sagnella Voth hydronium in tip three. This is Sagnella Voth in tip five. This is polarized hydronium in tip five and polarized in tip three. We see that if we pair the Sagnella Voth model with tip five or the polarized hydronium in, in tip three, we get the correct peak, the position of the peak of the RDF. And uh, also what we also get correct is a solvation free energy. If you do, I, I said that um, SV Signal of Voth in tip three gives you a very small solvation free energy, but if you do it in tip five, it gives you the right solvation free energy. A big difference is in the second solvation cell where AIMD has a peak and the tip three doesn't have any peak. So we looked at the structures around hydronium and one big difference was this is in tip three. The tip three is oriented with the dipole vector almost lined up with the oxygen oxygen vector. So it orients in a way that when you try to transfer the proton, you have to place it in this position to satisfy the pyramidal structure of hydronium. But then that position is not an H bonding position. So you lose an H bond when you transfer a proton. And that's why we get this large contribution from donor acceptor interactions. In tip 5P, because it has lone pairs, that is oriented correctly. So when you transfer the proton, it you maintain the H bond. But there is another uh, contribution there. It's the, the first shell, the hydronium first shell interactions. And that has to do with the, 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 the position of the peak in hydronium water versus water water. Water water interactions are weaker. The distance is at longer distance. The peak is at longer distances. So when you, and the energy is quite a sensitive function of the distance. So what you do when you, uh, uh, when a water becomes hydronium, the, the H bonds of the new hydronium with the surrounding waters are too long and you lose energy from that. And similarly, the, the old hydronium becomes water. Now the interactions are too close with the surrounding waters. So there is a mismatch of the optimal H bonding distance. And that appears as a, a loss of H bonds after a hop. And that causes the, the, the large delta A hop in the classical systems. So the conclusion from this work is that um, the, there is an imperfect orientation of tip 3P around uh, hydronium. And there's also, it's essentially the lack of polarizability in the, the ab initio simulations, the hydronium, the waters are polarizable. They adapt as the proton transfer takes place. Even before the proton transfer, the water acceptor has quite a bit of hydronium character. So the H bonds are much closer and you don't lose this energy upon instantaneous proton transfer. 
So that causes us to use a larger threshold for accepting a proton hop. Um, so the possible fixes, perhaps we can use tip 5P, that would improve things. And we can consider moving to polarizable models. Of course, that increases the, um, the, the cost. But um, I think that even with these um, deficiencies, we can still get insights using the cheap classical models in, in the examples that I mentioned. Okay, so I want to mention that this, this work was funded by the NSF. I want to thank you for your attention. And I'm happy to answer questions, as many as possible. But, you know, thank you. So we are ready for uh, not as many as possible questions. <laughs> thank you. Um, I have a question about uh, that uh, gating, <clears throat> I mean, bypass and process. Um, uh, DR salt bridge I'm for the uh, HP1 um, channel. Um, <clears throat> if I understand, I mean, remember correctly, um, a long time ago, maybe 20 years ago, uh, you uh, published a nice JAX paper on um, PMFs of uh, salt bridges. And according to uh, that work, um, for DR um, uh, salt bridges, the energy, free energy for the direct contact ion pair and water mediated ion pair are almost the same. In other words, uh, the water mediated state uh, is uh, quite stable. I'm wondering uh, if uh, the bypass process uh, is involved, I mean, is involving uh, such um, uh, water mediated state um, <clears throat> um, at the uh, DR assault bridge. In other words, uh, is it possible um, to transfer proton um, from D to water um, in that um, solvent mediated assault bridge? Right, so the big difference is that was in bulk water. So the, 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 the side chains can move uh, uh, freely and they can sample different states. Here we have a confined space the salt bridge, there's a, a limited amount of water around. There are just a few water molecules. And there are the confines of the, of the channel, of the protein, and the surrounding bilayer. And as we run dynamics, we don't see the, the salt bridge uh, uh, dissociating at all. If, if it dissociates, then then the, the ASP can get protonated and, and it's something can happen. So it, it's the issue of conformational fluctuations in combination with the confined space and the limited hydration. So we don't, we don't see this. Uh, uh, the, 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 the side chains separating. So uh, very nice talk. Thanks. Uh, I think this is very, very useful to see, and uh, especially in the future, I think uh, doing these polarizable models might make things uh, much better. Yeah, and when you were saying you don't get transition in Monte Carlo, I was thinking, uh, you know, we don't get it in constant pH because the orientations of water are wrong, but you should get it. But then again, the whole issue of the polarizability is and and getting the orientations right is is probably important but um so how so my question is somehow related to this so when you add this high voltage to to your uh uh protonated water uh how does that affect so the goal is to get push it through the channel uh but how does that affect the the transitions in a way because then it's also this high voltage will orient it differently that's maybe not realistic in a way and um i mean how does this affect the have you investigated the effect on the transition probabilities of using a high voltage well one thing it does is to push the hydronium as a as a molecule as an ion in mm -hmm. the in one direction mm -hmm. another thing it does for the surrounding H3O residues, it affects them, it, it uh, induces a certain or, uh, orientation. So mm -hmm. it can reorient them. Mm -hmm. So that can help the, the, the proton conduction as well. Mm -hmm. For the side chains, um, we need, for the, for the aspartate side chains, they are not 
very much affected because they are they are short. And I mean, if you if you apply voltage to arginines and lysines, you can see them stretching, mm -hmm. changing conformation. But for we don't see that much on on the ASP. Okay. And, and you need to include them in the in the voltage to allow proton um, transfer between them. Mm -hmm. And how much does uh, also affect um, other water, like the application? I mean, you don't use it on other water, but uh, in in the channel you might have the field. I don't know how much it uh, would affect the water molecules. The if regu you, if regular regular include water. all the water molecules, you would see electroporation basically. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of At work uh, on electroporation, and uh, you orient all the waters. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can you can have uh, pore formation in the lipid bilayer. Uh, you can have destabilization of the of the channel. Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, in a realistic system, you would have like really low voltage, and everything would be slightly oriented, right? Yeah. Yeah. The things that uh, all these systems are very slow. Yeah. They are much slower than ion channels, the potassium and sodium. So. There is no way. There's no other way. You can't wait that long sure. to get a realistic uh, uh, protocol conduction. So that brings me to my other question: Is how 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 long are your simulations? And I mean, uh, of course, for histidines we can't. But maybe like for for carboxylic residues, uh, yeah, the the time is of deprotonation is getting in the microsecond uh, range. Yes, so these simulations getting... are half a nanosecond. Okay. Um, so, but then everything uh, is deprotonates really easily. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very nice. It, it's difficult. You can't calculate conductance with these simulations. Now, if if there is if there is no titration of a side chain, it's just plain water. You may be able to extrapolate to these very high voltages. Again, I mean, it might be okay. It might be okay. But whenever you have titration, then you need to calculate the actual deprotonation rate. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. My question is. Um, is on the on the val on the actual experimental values of the kinetic constants for the proton exchange. You had a slide where you have a where you had um, mentioned this this paper by Eigen. Uh, is that that's that huge paper by Manfred Eigen where he where he measures several several acids. That's that's the one, right? That's the yeah. Or, it's or one with, of them, uh, at least. the relaxation kinetics. Yes. Uh, my question is. Let me try to put this clearly. Um, in those kind of experiments, the only uh, proton acceptor or donor, given the conditions in which they are made, would be either a similar molecule or water, water or hydronium, whatever. Uh, in, a, in a more typical uh, biomolecular condition, uh, you would have also around a lot of buffer molecules how would that affect the rates uh, how would that affect your parameterizations is that relevant or it is not relevant because you are in a channel where mo at least in these cases where most of the the things that are there are, are, are water molecules most of the ones that can um, get the protein or protons or how, how does would how would this affect the, the anything? If anything, I don't know. What do you think? There is some discussion of uh, the effect of buffers, uh, not in channels, but uh, in things like uh, membrane permeation and uh, proton equilibration between the membrane and the bulk. Uh, they think that buffers can uh, can mediate this transfer. Um, it, experimentally, it's um, we know nothing. Really? We know oh, nothing. Okay. Yeah. There's no kinetic data, as far as I know. I see. Okay. So, okay. Thank you so much. So along that line, um, many years ago, I uh, I said an experimental paper. I think um, 
Antonio too. I thought it's on the picosecond, on order of picosecond, for pronation to occur. But again, there are experiments I know of that measure certain salt bridge to break very slowly. I don't know what you can directly compare to that. Also, what? Maybe, maybe. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm wondering whether this, you know, the photo acid community um, does this where you, you know, liberate a proton very quickly and then you watch it um, move around and you can see where it goes, um, you know, and that that's, I think, fairly useful for seeing rates. Um, yeah, you, yeah. I'm sure you know that literature better than I. Yeah, about the um, HV1, so we found, so experimentally, uh, experiment data suggests there are two proton sensing residues on the inside and outside. So we found actually two. So by the way, our simulation only suggested three. Uh, three, maximum four, three or four residues that change PKs um, upon the conformation transition between the inward and outward facing state. Now, one of them is histidine, and that's been confirmed, that was not confirmed. They did it first experimentally. Tom did that, Tom DeGrossi. Uh, so just, their data strongly suggests that histidine to be the, I think, inward facing proton sensing residue. And our data really confirmed that. And then there's a second one is glutamic acid. It has a very large pK shift. Um, we, uh, Tom actually did measurement just a couple of weeks ago and, and showed us that nothing happened if, we, if they mutate that residue. Yeah, so th this is something I haven't talked about. It's the pH um, sensing. Uh, there have to be sensors on both sides, right? Because they both, it's the difference between the pH uh, values. So I suspect what's happening is that the, the charge on the S4 helix uh, affects how easy it will be to move. And, and that will shift the, the threshold voltage. So it can be, if you put charges on, on one side, or the other side, it can create some um, electrostatic interactions with the three arginines, and that can make it easier or more difficult to move the S4 helix. But it, it is we we also uh, done simulations with uh, high voltage, and we saw the three, histidine, uh, three arginines move up, breaking the salt bridge, and then but so, new salt bridge formed, compensating salt bridge is formed. Yeah, it's, it's pretty complex. We, we, we still haven't figured it out. Okay. One difficulty is we can't tell, we, we make these models, but we can't tell which one has the lowest free energy. If we had a method to calculate free energy for different states, at least we, we could argue that this one is the most stable at this, at, at this value of voltage. Yeah. 